So, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Daniela Kršová. I am a business development manager at SATEC Masaryk University in Brno. And I would like to welcome you to today's live after PhD, also known as Career Cafe Live. This is an event series organized since 2018 that aims to present people with PhD degrees who took their career paths. It's a great opportunity mainly for young researchers to meet inspiring speakers, listen to their stories and ask career related questions. We invite speakers not only from academia, from the private, private sector as well. We organize these lectures in cooperation with the twinning project partners so it is my great pleasure to welcome also participants outside SATEC. All of you are more than welcome to place your questions to our guest. You can do it via chat or raise your hand and ask directly. Today's speaker will be Dr. Emanuela Sani, Life Science Department Program Officer at the John Templeton Foundation. Emanuela obtained her bachelor's degree in agrobiotechnology and her master's degree in plants and microorganism biotechnology at the University of Pisa in Italy. Then she moved to Scotland to pursue her growing interest in plant epigenetics and completed her PhD in cell and molecular biology at the University of Glasgow in the UK. And what was her career after the PhD? What difficulties did she face? Emanuela is willing to share her experience with you, and I'm now giving her space to speak. Emanuela, the virtual floor is yours. Uh, if you will need uh, the uh, slides, I will do you uh, the host. Do you need it? Okay, I will try to switch you as a host. Make host or co-host, oh. yes. Yes. Yes, and now you will be able to do it. Um, okay, there we go. Just one second. And I would I would ask Oops. other participants to mute their uh, speakers so so that we can hear clearly, Emanuela. Okay, should okay. be able to see my screen now. Yeah, perfectly. Uh, we we now uh, see all the screens, so including the preface. Yeah, that's it. Super. <laughs> okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me today. I'm really excited to be here. And when I heard uh, the opportunity to talk to different PhD students, I really saw myself when I was a PhD student. And I had this moment that many times during my PhD thinking like, is this the right path that I want to do? Is I'm really convinced that this I want to be a PI for the rest of my life. What what's what's alternative are there? And I most of the time felt like um, I didn't have very clear in my head what I wanted in different point of my life. Things can change at different point of of your life too. So I think one big take home measure that I want you to have from today is that there is no linear path and things that you're comfortable. Uh, and very clear now they might not going to be in five years time but I think once you do a PhD you acquire a, just a great set of different skills they are not just related to your own work they can be easily transferred in many different um, other type of sectors not just the lab um, lab setting so as if I had to describe my experience before and after the, my PhD, I think I had a very unlinear path to it. Uh, maybe not too extremely unlinear, but I shifted fields many, many times, um, which, uh, which made, I think, um, my portfolio of our interests larger. But let me, let me get, dive into it uh, a little bit and tell you a little story about me. So this is like what many people think PhD is. You have this, uh, for example, I did a PhD in molecular biology in plant science. So I thought, well, I'm doing this. And then at the end of these three years, I will start applying for grants. And in a few years time, I will have my own lab. Well, this is not, this is really not what happened. Um, it was after, 
before I moved for my PhD, as uh, Daniela introduced, uh, I was in Italy doing my master and I was in sunny Italy and it was beautiful. I was really young, full of hope. And I decided well, I'm going to Scotland to pursue my PhD in plant science and it's going to be great. So the first thing that really hit me hard was the weather is not, it's not what I expected to be. And I know it sounds very trivial, but you have to come in from a really sunny country and then you're going to spend uh, three, four years of your life in constant rain. You better be very, very motivated during that time. Uh, <laughs> thankfully, it was the time of Ryanair fly being really cheap. So I could go back and forth a lot or shuffle around Europe. So I kind of tamed that a little bit with that. Um, so... Um, what did I get from my PhD experience? So my biggest challenge was moving to a foreign country. And back then I did my PhD, I started my PhD in 2009. So the requirement for languages was still a bit, um, the lines weren't so hard. So my English wasn't that great. Um, but I was very, very lucky that my supervisor kind of closed an eyes on that. And uh, and allow me to, to start a program anyway. And so when I arrived, I had a great language bar in front of me that I was not probably that prepared with that. But I'm sure many of you now know English on the back of your hands, so you probably won't have that problem. Um, but that was uh, for me a good, great push to learn how to be independent. Um, being dependent in the lab, so I was finally free to do most of the experiment I wanted to do. My, I was lucky to have a supervisor that was allowed me a lot of freedom during my PhD. Um, but I learned a lot of independence as a person. I feel I really grow as a person just, just from the fact I moved out from my house and I'm going to a different setting and I can flourish as a, as a scientist. Um, and I learned obviously new methods in molecular biology. That's what I was there for. Uh, they were spanning from the wet and the dry lab. Um, I think one of my problem a little bit at the beginning was that uh, um, I was very interested in uh, plants epigenetics, but unfortunately in my department, there were many people that were actually um, specialists in that. And the epigenetic fields was just starting to rise to its potential back then. So there were already very few people around the world that were very interested in epigenetics. But that was actually, while well, it was difficult going through this at the time, um, at the end, I realized it was a great challenge, but also a great opportunity because I had to create my own network outside my lab. So I had to connect with different people and try to collaborate with them. So I started to interact and networking. I think that was my first time in my life that I really had to push myself and start to expand my network of, uh, of people and my working network. Um, and that was great because I really developed a lot of social skill that turned out to be very useful later on in my life. Um, I also learned a lot of analytic skills um, because, you know, during your PhD, especially uh, as a plant's biology and molecular biology, you have to be really, really careful, uh, very keen on details of the thing that you are doing, um, the way you present it to people. So I thought I learned a lot out of that. So I was uh, really excited at the end of my PhD, although I was, yeah, as you know, you have a lot of up and down, but I was very lucky to have a really nice publication. Um, I really worked hard for that. Uh, but uh, that gave me the opportunity to apply for several postdocs. And uh, I was not really the size of what I wanted to do. I was a plant scientist. I worked on epigenetics. And that was it. That's all I knew. Um, but I really love epigenetics. I really love the subject. So I was not much committed to the organism as plant anymore. I just needed to know more about this mechanism and those mechanisms are fundamental. So you will find in every type of organism. So with that on my, on my mind, I decided to apply for a postdoc position because I was really driven to this, uh, you know, seeking knowledge in this field. So 
this position was actually in East biology. So um, I had this moment, I'm like, okay, the, the, I know this mechanism on molecular base are fundamental. So they will match um, all other organisms, but I'm a plant biology. I know nothing about East. I mean, apart from like uh, little knowledge from university. Um, but I think this is uh, something that we always think about ourselves or what we do not know. We never put ourselves in the position of what do I bring to a new lab, which are the skills that I have maturated along my uh, training that a future employer will seek in me because nobody wants someone to tick exactly all these boxes because these people are already in their labs. They're always seeking people they have different views. Um, obviously, they need to be an expert in the area, uh, laterally in the area. But I think that's what most of PI are looking for when they hire new people. And that's why I think I got selected for my knowledge in epigenetics, although it wasn't co completely constraining to East biology. But don't say it, uh, I was very lucky that my mentor was an extremely well-known person in the field. She's been working on RNA splicing in East for most of her career. And she really gave me so much guidance in learning uh, um, a new set of skills that we'll need for the lab, but also all the um, fundamental literature that goes into that. So I remember spending hours and hours just at the beginning of my postdoc, not touching the bench at all, and just reading literature, reading paper. And I felt like, is this my master program all over again? <laughs> and it was a bit daunting at the beginning because you finish that is at the end of your PhD, you are really an expert in your area. And then I felt like this is such a step back because I feel I don't know any of this. I need to learn even more. So it was a bit of a bumpy transition, but uh, you can you can do it. You can push through it, and uh, you know it was it's gonna be very rewarding because what you're gonna do you're just gonna enter into another field. You will redefine your scientific network again, so you will expand even more the people that you will go and interact to, the type of interest that you probably would never heard before, and probably you and you will have other things that's gonna catch your mind and your interest. And also redefine my place as a scientist and still feeling like I have this baggage of plant scientists with me and now I'm acquiring something bigger. And I thought was was really cool. So I have a lot of opportunity during my first postdoc, which lasted for quite a while. It was about, um, almost eight years of postdoc that I did in this in this particular lab at the University of Edinburgh. And it gave me a lot of opportunity um, in science, where again, I learned a lot of interesting lab skills and methods. I've been always been, I always loved the bench. That's always where I found myself as naturally belonging. So this is also one of the things that I want to tell you about because uh, more I was going up with my postdoc position and with my career as a postdoc, I always felt I want to, my end point is, is having my own lab. But there is this balance that you are start to having to spend little less and less moment at the bench and more and more administrative and grants writing part. I knew that was gonna be happening to me at some point. But, you know, this was early days and uh, I wanted to explore other things in biology. So I kind of left it in the back. And uh, yeah, so it was a great experience, especially because my supervisor really pushed me to participate to many international conferences. And that was the first time I had the opportunity to go and present to the US. Uh, which for me was a completely different scenery. I think conferences there are very different from European conferences. Um, there are, depend which one you're going to pick, but let's say if you go 
to a big conference, there's going to be thousands and thousands of people conference. It's going to be really overwhelming. You really feel like, uh, what is happening here? <laughs> it's so, that was very daunting for me, especially the first time um, when you have all these parallel sessions that just cross one another and you, you need to choose and the booklet for the conference it's like three inches thick and and you're like I want to know everything but I can't possibly know anything so I think this is also one moment of my life that I realized that I really need to start to be focused a little bit on the things I want to know um, and I think going to conferences is something that really help me to define what are my scientific interests and also things that are a bit behind the science as well. Um, and one thing that I learned a lot during my first postdoc is to how to convene my ideas, because I think as a scientist, it's really important that you know what you're doing, but you need to be able to explain to other people as well. Because if you want to do an impact in the world, you have to interact with the world. So I feel like you really have to be able to engage in with the public, engaging with people, engaging with other peers on what you're doing, because you are the expert in that area. And you should, you know, feeling comfortable to having conversation with people and transmitting your knowledge as small or larger it is. Um, so I had all these great opportunities during my postdoc and I took most of them. <laughs> um, and I was working on uh, uh, my, my work at the time at the bench was on epigenetics changing and relation with splicing, which I find splicing an incredibly complicated area to go into. It. Um, there are the mechanisms there that are really, really tough to understand. But as I say, I was happy to have a good mentor that helped me to navigate um, how to go along with this giant side of the literature that I was not familiar with it. I also uh, found myself seeking help to other postdocs as well that were in my, not directly in my lab, but other labs next to me. And uh, I did not make as much effort in going to online community because I think, I feel so old saying this, but I think back then they weren't really um, developed as they are now. So I didn't find it that useful as they are now. Um, but yes, I, I think... What, what I want you to know that if you are considering to move into another field, it's going to be a challenge for you, but it's absolutely possible. And uh, you have to think as yourself, enriching the lab that you're going to with the thing that you know and, and bringing those to them. And that's our, this is what your strongest point. Then I, I did another postdoc, which I thought, was going to be, you know, the start of a new career um, because uh, I decided to, I've been hooked on the RNA biology side a bit more. So I decided to leave a little bit aside the epigenetics interest that I have and exploring more the RNA biology per se. Um, so yeah, I kind of changed field again since like uh, recurring things in my life, but so this was more a lateral move than a completely um, crazy jump into the unknown. Um, and again, I found myself to redefine uh, my scientific network in place. Um, but at that time, this was uh, 2018. And the time is important because obviously, you know, we all know what happened in 2020. <laughs> so this was like two years before the pandemic. Um, we were all completely oblivious to what was going to happen. So I was having my happy life at the bench. But I also started to explore other things that my university was giving me as opportunity to do. Like they, they really wanted to create a new postdoc society 
So having a space for postdoc to come once a month and just discuss the problem the postdocs have. And this is something that I always liked having uh, networking with people. So um, I was the president of this society and <laughs> this was funny because it was, we all know postdocs are really, really busy people. So everybody was really happy with the society, which meant we're going to get free pizza once a month, basically. And we just discuss about science. This is great. But who's want to deal with the paperwork? Very few people want to deal with paperwork. <laughs> so as you will see that um, when you start to dealing with people, um, a lot of people always say they are wanted to do everything, but when is the time to actually doing things, do not expect the same people that tell you they're going to be there to actually show up. Uh, this is super common. Um, but I really wanted to have this, uh, you know, opportunity. So I was like, sure, oh, I can, I can do that. Uh, the, which meant like organizing the, um, the sessions, uh, which was very easy to be honest. But uh, it was, um, it was my first taste, let's say, of starting organizing and bringing people together. It was a very small step, but I think that was what has really changed me in the future. Because uh, this meeting, they were basically just a chance for postdoc to talk about their science, invited some speaker as uh, uh, we are doing today and talking about that experience during the postdoc or after the postdoc, um, having speakers like uh, PI to come over and explain their experience in their transition in between postdoc and being a PI. So they were all, I think, things that I wanted to know and people, my peers wanted to know. But for me, it was also like a first taste of, I really like when people coming together. I love this. I love the vibes. I, this is something that I really want to do it. I don't know how, but, you know, this is one small thing that I want to do uh, with, with, with my time. And then it happened that my previous uh, supervisor, postdoc supervisor, she was retiring. And for that, she wanted to, well, we, dis we decided as a lab that she, she was a great, she's a great scientist. So we were thinking she should have a proper recognition that come from us and give her the opportunity to have a meeting where all scientists come and uh, have a talk on their um, career where my supervisor came along with them. So I took like the, the lead on that and start to organize with meeting this meeting, which meant uh, you have to find money for that. <laughs> so how do you find money for organizing a meeting? Well, there is a lot of people out there that cannot wait to give you money. <laughs> there are so many grants that are for these type of things that you cannot believe uh, how easy it can be to get 5,000, 2,000 pounds uh, per organizing a meeting. And especially if you start to tap into people that work in uh, industry. So if you're going to have, let's say, um, some company that sell whatever laboratory equipment, they, they're usually quite happy to sponsor with small donation, I don't know, 500 euro donation, which is, you know, they are small. But if you start to put all these donations together, you start actually to have a nice budget. And that's exactly what happened. Um, we were able to hold this meeting for, I think there were almost 200 people invited there. And we have most of them covered by those little grants. They were from different societies, um, industry partner. And, and it was like, and that opened to me a massive world. I'm like, wow, there is so much money out there that it can be used. I didn't know any of this. And I was really excited. And on the... On the tail of this excitement, I decided to start a new collaborative network 
for young RNA researcher. So in Edinburgh, there are three different institutes where they, they are like around the city of Edinburgh, where the um, RNA biology is, um, uh, research is made. So I partner with other people to creating meetings where just for RNA focused people, and we'll be rotated in this institute. And um, we decide to apply for a small grant to the RNA society, which they were very happy to support this type of event. And we got the money for it and we hosted the first meeting. And it was, it was really fulfilling because you could see how these people just coming together and talking about science. And I absolutely loved it. And then it was the moment that I thought, I can write grants. Um, I really like this environment. I really want to be an event organizer. It would it be amazing? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, big pandemics in the middle of this. So it means like no more in-person meeting, nothing. So I was a bit struck with like, I don't know what to do with these thoughts now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, very unfortunate. Okay, let's put on hold on event organizing for a moment. I don't know what's going to happen with that. But that's kind of sparkled something into me, which I was really interesting to pursue at some point. In the midst of that, I started a podcast collaboration with a philosopher. Um, the post podcast is called the Reluctant Theologian Podcast. And to date, we have done over 100 episodes. They cover science, philosophy, and theology. And that is something that always interested to me, uh, always been an interest of me, thinking about how bigger question about science can really impact humanity. Um, so the consequence of the science that we're actually doing, um, what is, um, how it's going to affect us. For example, as a molecular biologist, I say I will be interested in aging. What are the consequences? People start not aging anymore. So we're going to have so many people that are really alive and living forever. Is this an ethical thing to do? So I have all these questions that start to popping out in my head. And it was so great to have this collaboration on, on, this, on this media. Uh, and uh, having expert in philosophy, they were there and helping me to unpack this fundamental question that as a scientist, I, I have. So this was, uh, again, another piece of the puzzle there that really started to make me feel, I love science, but there is so much more out there. So I started to have this conflict in me. And... Uh, didn't know really much what to do. So yeah, as I say, uh, I was in one year on my second postdoc experience and the 20 pandemic, 2020 pandemic happened. So all the wonderful networking activity I wanted to do, the event organized I wanted to do, they were not possible anymore. Uh, you couldn't even, you know, leave your house, especially in, I was in Scotland at the moment at the time and it was very strict uh, uh, lockdown. But uh, our PI uh, one day told us um, if we had the opportunity to work on COVID research, we would be doing that. And we were, I think, a month into the lockdown. Everybody was like, yes, please. I don't want to stay home anymore. I will do anything <laughs> to get off this house. That was basically the approach. And then was like, I want to do something for humanity. This is really amazing. Yes. I'm Finally, I studied RNA splicing in yeast, and I'm, now I can do something for humanity. This is so exciting, <laughs> which I always see myself doing very specialistic um, things, and now is, is my moment to shine. So um, I was very grateful for our PI to take in that approach. And, uh, but that means that, okay, I always worked in plants, and I worked in yeast. Uh, this is a virus. Here we go again. <laughs> uh, that sounds very familiar to me, shifting field or like taking lateral moves. This is my third lateral moves I'm doing because this is an RNA virus. And as we know, um, 
fundamental mechanisms are really fundamental and it doesn't really matter that much where which organs you're looking at as long as you look at the very basic of, of, of things um so i took this opportunity to initiate a collaboration with the avarology uh, lab next door it was conveniently located next door <laughs> and uh, i had of course you need to get some training for working with viruses. You cannot just like show up uh, and start doing handling of, uh, you know, hazard material. We did not working with COVID-19. We were working with coronaviruses that, you know, they're they are not deadly, but still you want to take you know, the right precaution to it. So I took that opportunity to work on really cutting edge virology, virology research. And I felt really fulfilled with that. And at the end of that, I something else happened though. I had this great feeling of I'm helping humanity. I'm on the bench. That's where I want to be. But then it happened that my pod podcast collaboration, it led to um, more academic conversation with philosopher and theologian and we have been we've been collaborating on writing a paper and the paper got accepted in a philosophy journal which for me was like amazing this is like wow it's beyond science and that's that's the other piece of the puzzle that really made me think I don't know if I want to be at the bench anymore there is so much more out there that I could do and I feel I want to do, but if only, you know, the right opportunity came along and guess what? <laughs> do I just want to tell you, do not underestimate social network. My husband, literally that, that the story goes literally like this. My husband saw an upcoming job opportunity that was posted over a friend's Facebook page and the job was a, a program officer position at the Templeton Foundation in, in the US. And I read the project description and it's about networking with scientists, uh, creating new program with scientists, organizing events, um, lots of other things. But these were like all these amazing like green flags start to pop in my head. I'm like, wow, this is, this is what I want to do. Yeah, but then there was the phase, oh my God, the job is in the US. That means like relocating again. And this time it's me and my husband is not just me. So we're a family. Things are getting more complicated and more real because life is complicated. And then we'll also be leaving all the friends behind me. So all my social life and social circle will be gone. And also they will be leaving academia for goods because let's face it, if you're not gonna, if you're gonna move away and be in a completely different field that is, doesn't allow your publication, coming back will be extremely hard. So I wanted to be very honest with myself and say, can I just go move away from academia? Am I ready for that? And is that what we want as a family? Are we be ready? Are we ready to just leave everything, pack and go? And uh, you know, I am not twenty years old anymore. <laughs> but we sit down, um, the both of us, and my husband asked me a very direct question: What do I really like to do at this point in my life? Because I have changed. I'm a different person of the one that started a PhD in Scotland in two thousand and nine. Uh, now it's 2020 <laughs> and the world has changed everything has changed can I change even more can I push myself um so I just sit down and I'm like and I and I've been very honest with myself and we we say okay what 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 do I like to do um I really like discuss science and even things beyond science like philosophy is becoming a really interested big interest of mine I really like organized networking. I love like bringing people together in events and conferences. And as I say, I'm very passionate about deeper question about humanity. Now, for me, science is not, is not enough anymore. I want to know more about different things. Um, I'm also passionate about 
economics and sustainability because having a plant science background that's always been in the back of my of my baggage of, uh, of interest as well and I'm also interested in in the advocacy and raising awareness uh, in ecological uh, um, issues so and then I had myself to say well well I'm an academic person I'm not I've done nothing else since since now what do I have to offer to this future employer? They look at me. What, what do I have? Well, let's think for a minute. I have I've created a very large young research network that span across discipline, not just science, but I had like also people that constantly interact, they work in philosophy and in theology. I have at that point um, almost a decade experience in the academic setting because this was at the end of my second postdoc. I have a wide knowledge of several biological systems because I handle plants, I handle yeast, I handle viruses. I feel like I navigate myself flexible enough through different kingdoms. I think at this point, I managed to have a lot of social skill and networking. I always been a curious and analytic mind. And I love travel. So the location part, I'm not going to suffer that much for that um, so we said yes let's take this opportunity and go ahead and apply for this job this uh, I've been warned my husband is American and and actually it was great for me to have this type of information from him because the company that was going to apply for the job is an American corporate company and everything is different it's starting from the interview process, eh, which is a very elaborate process. So you're going to be subjective to multiple interview rounds. I think I had four or five different rounds of interview, um, which were not just talking to one person. It was talking with, the, well, it was talking with like people from HR that will do like a personality assessment on you people from other departments that would look like how you would fit in the company, but also had to write essays. And I've been given like mock evaluation of different projects because, you know, being a program officer means that uh, you will receive grants application and you will need to rank them and decide which are the more valuable proposition that you get. So, I've been giving this exercise during my interview process, which lasted months. So if you apply for this type of job, be prepared, be patient, because it's a long process and it's, it's, a, it's a hard process to go through, especially as, um, as an European, I never experienced that. Usually I always had like one Skype interview, one, and if you pass that, you would have like an in-person interview and then you basically are done. But this this has been this has been something I did not expect, and I wish someone would, you know, warn me about this. <laughs> um, then another thing of the of the very speciality of the U.S. is that even if they make you um, an offer, you can negotiate it, and the negotiation part for me was like. I don't know what to do. If I ask too much, are they going to still hire me? If I ask too little, I'm going to be stuck with this uh, little salary. And then how I'm going to increase the salary? How easy is that? So these are all things that in the US you are and you can and you have to negotiate it. So you can negotiate different things and the number of days off because this is very different from, from Europe. You can negotiate the salary. The salary usually have a range. So you will, you can ask in, in base of your expertise, uh, where you see yourself in the range. And for after the pandemic, you can also negotiate it um, if it's possible, remote working opportunities. So working from home, because uh, I was going to transition into an office job. So this would be a possibility for me to consider. So I just want you to, to know that they will make it, what usually happen, they will make you an offer. Most of the people look at the, at the number and they decline that. And they're like, I want actually this. 
there's going to be a bit of back and forth. So don't be scared. It's a completely normal process. This is completely expected. And I said yes to the job. I, when I got the offer, I was really excited. So I was like, okay, let's pack everything. No, there's <laughs> another things in the middle. Um, you need to go through a very long visa process. Uh, it's You're going to apply for a working visa in the US. It could take up to a year, depending on your situation. It could be shorter, it could be longer. So I would really recommend you to be extremely responsive with a person that you will be um, connected to provide every documentation that they need because if the process is already slow, don't make it even slower. For giving an idea, my situation was, I think, a bit um, unique because it was during the pandemic that I did my relocation. Um, but it's, I got the job offer in January and I started my job in August. So it was extremely fast although there was a pandemic in between, but different company can have different uh, timing depending how much they, not how much they want you, but how much they are willing to pay lawyers as well to make your uh, process easier for you. So just, it's not unheard of that you get a jo job offer at the beginning of the year and you will start the year after that. So just for you in having in mind this, you know, if you need to give like notice for your current job as well. But, you know, we, we got there in the end. It was super exciting. We, we relocate from Edinburgh, Scotland to Philadelphia, US, Pennsylvania. And uh, it was, um, we, we came here in August uh, from, from Scotland where, you know, always raining and not that hot to an incredibly hot country. <laughs> <laughs> It was a shock for us. We we couldn't leave the house because it was like 40 degrees every day and 100% humidity, um, which were like, oh my God, did we do the right choice straight away? But we bear with it. Um, so yeah, then I started my career, my new career as a program officer at the John Templeton Foundation. And the foundation goal is to uh, fund research that catalyze conversion that enable people to create lives of purpose and meaning. So for me, the, this, this type of foundation was actually exactly what I wanted because I have interest in life science. I'm an expert in genetics, but I also have a lot of interest in philosophy and deep question that comes from the humanities. So this for me was the exact company that I really wanted to work for. Um, and I thought this is going to give me the, the setting for flourishing as a person even more. Um, then I started to enter in corporate America and I found that's a bigger challenge than I thought it was going to be. Um, there are, there have been different little shocks. It was first the cultural shock, which America is, I feel like I'm in a parallel, slightly parallel universe where Everybody in my universe, everybody's supposed to wear a red shirt. Uh, but in America, everybody wear a green shirt. So it's exactly the same, but it's a slightly different. That's a tiny small difference. And that's how I feel culturally. <laughs> um, the workplace is also very different. You're not in the lab. So the setting is different. Everybody has to dress up. So already the dress code for me was like a bit of a shock. I'm like, I never care the way I dress, and now I need to care about the way I dress. Um, and then for me, I think another big shock was the amount of administration responsibility that was I was being given, uh, which I know this was part of the job, but I never done anything like that. So uh, I felt like this is very overwhelming. Um, but um, uh, as a whole, I think I always start to keep in mind uh, what working in philanthropy actually means. Um, so I think the bigger point are that you need to take yourself out from your specialistic view of science and became more open and interested in a different things. So basically you need to become a generalist instead of a specialist. This is because you will be sent a grant where you're not going to be a total expert on because if we are funding in, uh, for example, epigenetics, I can be people send us grant on 
medicine related things, diagnostic, uh, plants, it could be, you know, a very broad spectrum of things. So you, you really need to get off your comfort zone, reading more literature about different things, but also we rely on, on experts that they're going to um, reviewing those grants were for us too. And then you start to see science in a different way. This is someone's money. So this is an investment that you're going to do. So you cannot just be driven by the science. You need to consider many things. Um, you need to consider who is the person doing the job? Who, what is the institution um, where the job, uh, the work is going to be, is going to be done? Who is the team that's going to be doing this job? So there are like many different things that can make uh, grant successful um, and then there are other things they are very more technical like everything that we found has to comply to what the donor wanted that we found so I need to keep that in mind and also there is a different side of everything that I am now dealing with legally binding documents and the type of communication I have to have is you know, can put me in trouble if I say the wrong thing. So I need to be careful on that too, which is, I never had that experience before. So I just want to end this uh, presentation, just telling you what I actually do day to day and what a program officer does. Um, so you have, I feel, when I was thinking about this yesterday, I feel like I have different hats. Uh, I have different roles, depending on what, the um, what the things I'm, I'm I'm dealing with so there is a very important relational component because you need to develop relationship with the grantees the person that is going to make the the work for you um, this is really important because situation can you know you allow a, a grant for three five years so you really want to you know be sure that's the right person um, and we are a pretty, um, I would say, medium-sized foundation. So we we have a lot of personal interaction with the grantees. Um, and also you want to start to develop relationship with other funding agencies that promote similar goals. So there is a lot of relational networking that goes into in this, in this job. And another important part is the programmatic part of the job. So you are now managing a portfolio of interests. So it's not about just science. Um, I personally manage the genetics um, portfolio, but also what we call the um, genius portfolio, which is uh, about uh, enhancing cognitive capacity and talent. Um, so those are more psychological uh, grants um, in a broad strokes. Um, so this is something that, I need to have uh, uh, a very open mind of what uh, things have been sent to me. Um, and also in the programmatic part, I have to, I'm in charge of developing of grants, but also monitoring those grants and all the administrative part that goes in the monitor of the grant to be sure that the people get the money on time, um, reading the report, so be sure that they are doing what the grant is asked them to do and be compliant for their grant agreement. So I need to be checked that. So every, every three months, we ask them to write some progress report to us and we monitor the progress of the grant. Um, and also I need to keep up with the science because we wanna be a cutting edge funding agency. So we need to know what is exciting and what is happening. Um, and that's the, for me is the funniest part of the job because uh, for doing that, I have to attend conferences and seminars. This means a lot of traveling. So from basically when conference season starts, which is usually spring to mid uh, autumn, I'm going to be all over the world, all different conferences. I want to be there and see who are the players, who are the key players in the field to see if we can support them. So um, this is like in a, in a nutshell, I think, <laughs> very long, big, large nutshell, um, my career path and how did I got uh, here. Uh, and I hope you went and, you know, I sparked some interest uh, in you and I'm really happy to take your question if you have any of them. Thank you, Amanda. It was uh, really thrilling uh, 
speech. Uh, it was like a movie. Uh, I would like to say, uh, because uh, there were some twists in your career and in your life. Uh, I will have a look uh, into the chat. So far, we don't have any questions. So I would like to ask you, uh, at the time you were considering the moving into US, into America, uh, you were only you and husband, right? Uh, no yes. kids. Do you think that it would be different, the decision, if you would be or uh, will be um, or in that time already have a kids or one or more kids or the decision would be the same? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, um, I so the, the way we approach this, me and my husband, my husband is also an academic, um, so he's a philosopher, which is making things even harder finding two people uh, a job in academia at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So when I've been finding this job has been presented as, uh, um, you know, a permanent position, it was a game changer for us too. So I probably think if we had kids, we would most probably do the same choice and just move. Okay. But, you know, I, I can't tell you for sure, but I think the economic component is, is big. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I, but but uh, as you already told, the change between Europe and US is uh, a big, uh, big leap. And there are so much uh, administration uh, to do that uh, it's, uh, it's horrifying. I don't know uh, how to say it. So uh, congratulations and you are very brave. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Back, back to your PhD studies, um, uh, do you do you think that uh, they were uh, yeah you were you were talking about the language barrier in the in the beginning, uh, but uh, was there any other challenging thing in the PhD uh, part of your life? Um, for me, um, so after my master, I had uh, one year. I spent one year in Italy as a research assistant. Um, so I was, uh, I had a very good experience of how, how a lab runs for a whole year before moving to my PhD. So I didn't have much of a problem to integrate into a new lab. Uh, what for me was more challenging was more than they were in many people, uh, specialized on exactly on the subject I was working on. So that was the. That was the hardest part for me, start to find ways to engage with people that works on epigenetics. And uh, that, 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 was, that was hard, but uh, possible because I had uh, um, a second supervisor and collaborator. So I was like pestering him a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, from our, uh, are there any questions from our... Um... Participants, yeah, we have hi Emanuela, very inspiring talk. I wanted to ask you about the postdoc network. Uh, did you create it? How hard it was to organize it? What exactly was the process? What were you doing on such meetings, etc.? Because we don't have yeah. something, yeah. Sure. Um, sorry, <laughs> I was reading the the the, the question. Yeah. Um, so I was part of the Wellcome Trust uh, um, Center for Cell Biology. So we had uh, a pot of money for that server, but nobody wanted to touch that. <laughs> because I feel like uh, uh, we're all very busy as a postdoc or as a PhD student, you definitely notice there is a seminar every day. You would engage 100% of your time. When you're not the bench, there will be something for you. So creating a new network is always a challenge because people are extremely busy. Um, so you usually can incentivize them to come with food and alcohol as well. <laughs> That's usually kind of work quite well. Um, and for the meetings, we, we decided, um, we had a first meeting to decide what we want to talk about. It. So we were very open. We 
we think this is a good opportunity for us to come together. How do we want to use this opportunity? And I think this is our question that you should ask to your peers, because I don't think people will give you the same answer. In fact, people gave us very many different answers when we asked this question. Some people wanted to talk about just science and what they were interested to. Other people wanted to know, well, I want to be a PI at some point. How does it look like? Um, can we have other PIs, younger PIs that you just started uh, at the Institute to come and tell us how that experience was? I want to hear about that. Other people were more interested. I want to go to industry. I don't care after here. I just want to get out of university. Can we have some speaker from industry and tell and ask them what they expect from us? So the type of question, they were, they're very different. And I think as long as you have like people engaging with you, uh, you could find uh, your the way you want to go and drive the conversation. Um, and uh, yes, there are, if you want to set up network like this, I would really recommend for, for having a little budget for you uh, and uh, organizing, for example, um, uh, catering for those events or uh, having invited speakers, if you want a scientist coming to you and speak, um, I would definitely recommend you to look at different societies. Uh, they have usually have grants dedicated to this. For example, uh, I don't know, the American Society for Plant Biology, they have little money for networking. The RNA Society has money for networking. So just look around on their society pages and which type of grant they have, and you could get some budget. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question in chat. Hi, Manuela, nice talk. What do you think we are uh, the opportunities for the plant biologist if they don't want to continue in acad academia, but still wants to continue working with science? I think that uh, your, your way is one of one example. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you you, con you continue, in fact, uh, with the science, but in another way. Am I right? Yes, that's uh, absolutely right. I think I feel like I'm engaging with science a lot. I'm, I'm on a different level now. I'm not the person that drive that experiment, but I, I have a lot of say on more the programmatic side of, uh, of uh, you know, different things they can develop from it. Um, and I think like plant science in general, they had, they can go, they have a lot of different opportunity, um, especially now with this uh, um, big interest on climate so um, and sustainability. So I think there is a lot of opportunity more than there used to be like 10 years ago when I started um, to go in different sectors they are interested in like this global climate crisis or sustainability of plants, sustainability in the economy. I think there is a lot there that uh, plant sizing can can bring. Yeah, so so I would I would answer that, that uh, to have more opportunities for a plant biologist is to stay open, right? And learn more things that you are normally learning in the at school uh, and to because for example for me it was interesting that uh, you uh, changed the field into psychology theology and that was the opening and uh, broadening your mind uh, let's say and this uh, led you to the opportunity to work uh, where, where we are here now. So to be open, right? Yes, absolutely. And I, I really encourage everybody to not just go to this seminar of their own institution, but also consider other type of seminars they are from other faculties, uh, just to broaden yourself, because I, I, I feel like it's just so much more interest if you could go like for our seminar that is targeting physics for example uh, or astrobiology uh, there's so much knowledge up there just on your doorstep yeah 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 there is okay uh, here is another question from Stella Kanta uh, how exactly did you negotiate the salary uh, did you contact people working in the same company 
to ask them or this is something you wouldn't recommend? Um, so what I recommend is uh, ask for the range, you, which is the salary range that a company has, because it could be from, let's say, 10 to 20. So, you know, the range is large. Um, and then, you know, be prepared to argue how much you're worth for it. Uh, because, you know, if you feel like, okay, I have, for example, I have 10 years in, in academic experience and I have a PhD, certainly you cannot consider myself as starting. I do not consider myself as starting. Um, so don't be worried to be bold. And especially as a woman, women are notoriously terrible in negotiating salary. <laughs> so mm -hmm. just be brave because uh, after five rounds of interview, if they pick you, you know, they're, they're going to be pretty convinced that you are the right candidate. So you have all the right to show yourself how worth you are. Great. Yeah, thank you. So are there any questions? You can also raise your hand and talk directly to Emanuela if you want. If there is no question, I have another one. Uh, knowing what you know now, is there anything you would have done differently during your PhD or postdoc career to be more prepared for your future life? I know that you, in the time, you didn't know that uh, the pandemics will come, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, is there anything you would have done differently? I would probably have started earlier to um start to have engaging more with different discipline that's one thing that will i i enjoy the most at the moment so probably i would love to have starting with the uh engaging with philosopher or physics early in my career that but i think probably i was not ready for that uh especially as a person i don't think I was very, you know, very young and I was eager for something else. So probably wasn't the right moment. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I will wait some few seconds for your questions from audience. I think there are none. So I would like to thank you, Emanuela, very much for your inspiring lecture. I want to thank also all participants for their excellent questions. And before I say farewell, I would like to recommend you follow our SATEC website or social media because we are already preparing another Life Life to PhD session. And we will be pleased if you fill out uh, our questionnaire uh, that you will receive by email soon. It will help us to improve this event in the future. So thank you very much. Have a lovely rest of the day. And I look forward to seeing you in the next time. Bye-bye. Bye, Amanda. -bye. Bye, thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>